blessing to you. As we continue our study in the prison epistles, please turn, as you were instructed, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. We'll be reading the whole chapter this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 3, as Paul is relating some information to his brother Timothy. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not covetous. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Continuing on in verse 8, likewise deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let those, excuse me, let these also first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. This is a faithful saying. Excuse me, I got two copies here. That's also a faithful saying. May God add his blessing to the reading and our understanding of his word. Thank you. There's a step there. It says new. All right, so today's sermon title is uh, kind of a follow-up from last week's. Today's sermon title is, Paul Picks a Fight with Squaw Creek Baptist Church. Now, last week was Paul Picks a Fight Round 1. This one could be called Round 2. And in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, we saw some real fighting words, at least words that many people have seen as uh, contentious, problematic, uh, difficult to explain, downright uh, argumentative. And last week, but once we understood what God was actually saying, once we did the work to understand the text, the fight was over, wasn't it? I mean, really, the fight was over. Last week's passage was, as I mentioned, more a freedom sentence than a prison sentence for women. And once properly understood, the teachings of 1 Timothy 2 become freeing and honoring to female believers or believerettes, or believeresses, ex-chromosomal Christians. What do, you, what, what do you ladies want to be called? I, daughters of God. We'll leave it at that. In all honesty, 1 Timothy chapter 2, far from putting you in a place of dishonor, elevates you and gives you the freedom to, uh, to come before the Lord undistracted without the cares and, and problems that come along with being a woman in this world. So the question is, are we willing to do the hard work to understand the text 
And having answered that question in the affirmative, last week we did the hard work and we walked out of here more free than we've ever been perhaps before in regards to that passage. Having answered that question in the affirmative, the next question becomes, are we willing to let the text lead us or are we too married to our own traditions? Before you answer that, let's make sure you know what you're saying. What we're saying, if we really mean that the Word of God will guide us more than our traditions, is that we are willing to do something that is very unbaptisty. Change. Change is hard. And it's, it's scary. I mean, Halloween is still a month away, but the scary starts right now for us, right? To have change. Last week's call to change was pretty easy, though, wasn't it? To change our views. We like change that gives us the tools to express and defend what we've always believed. I mean, we knew the Bible didn't really mean women are second-class citizens, but far too few of us knew how to explain what it did mean. And last week's message, I pray, gave us those tools and, and changed our view of a difficult passage. That's easy change. That's fun change. We like that change. Change that supports what we believe is easy. What about change that demands we adjust our beliefs? That's not so easy, is it? For some of us, we come today to a passage that will, at the very least, challenge us to look more closely at what we believe or what we thought we understood. We may even have to confront some traditions here at Squaw Creek. I don't know if we'll actually make any changes, but my point today is not to, to, to call a referendum on our Constitution and bylaws. All I seek to do today is to preach the Word as accurately as I know how, and let the Holy Spirit guide us forward. It is altogether improper for me to stand here in front of you from the pulpit and begin to try to accomplish any type of an agenda towards our constitution or bylaws, let alone to then put it out on the internet to the whole world. That is not my goal today. However, I don't believe that we can take an honest look at this passage and then an honest look at our constitution and bylaws and say, Yes, God, I will stand before you and defend our traditions that run contrary to your word. And so I cannot help but just acknowledge up front that what we will find in Scripture today is really just the beginning of a much deeper study that must be undertaken before we even begin to think about trying to change anything about how our uh, governing documents are written. And I'm not calling for that change. What I want is for the Holy Spirit to lead us and for us to be obedient to Him. If the Holy Spirit leads us to change, I want it to come from Him through you. I have made the mistake many times in my career as a pastor of trying to force change. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. And I'll tell you, it never worked when I tried to do the Holy Spirit's job. I'll let Him lead through His Word and we'll all agree to be faithful and obedient, even if it means change. Even if it means hard change. Even if it means that I have to change. So while last week's passage didn't really pick a fight, this week's passage kind of does, and we need to be prepared. This morning we're going to look at the biblical office of elder, the biblical office of diacono, and then in our final section we'll see how this passage calls us, regardless of whether we are elders or deacons or deaconesses, any kind of an elected official, this passage calls us to discipleship. So knowing what's coming, I feel the need to go to the Lord in prayer. Why don't we do that right now? Lord, we come again to a passage that many of us have always thought we had understood, even if something didn't quite seem right. Help us, Lord, to be strong in our beliefs. We don't want to lightly change what we believe to be true. But help us also, Holy Spirit, to be willing to change if we're confronted with genuine truth. And I don't know, Lord, if that's going to happen today. I just know that this passage seems to run afoul of our church's polity. Forgive me, Lord, because let me put it a different way. Our polity, the way we do things, seems to run afoul of your perfect word. And your word is the standard, not ours. Father, I pray as well that we do not get mired in verbiage or bogged down in semantics, but that we might truly glean from this passage what you would have us learn. Help us to be good disciples, to hold and to live by sound doctrine, and to fill our schedules and our minds with the things that you have called us to do. May we exalt you in all things, love other believers at all costs, and reach the lost in all opportunities. 
It's in your name that we pray. Amen. We begin, because Paul does in chapter 3, with a a study of the the position, the office of episcopus. In some translations, the New King James calls it bishop, others call it overseer, elder, or pastor. All four of those words are the same Greek word, episcopus. And the office that Paul is addressing here in the first seven verses is the office most commonly referred to as elder. But within the biblical record, there are lay elders and vocational elders. And we tend to call lay elders elders because they don't make a living doing the ministry of the church. We call vocational elders pastors because we do make our living doing ministry. But biblically speaking, the office is the same. There is no distinction, although the roles are slightly different. There is no distinction in the qualifications or the job description for those who make their living as elders and those who make their living doing something else and serve as elders within the church. And we're not going to get much into those differences today, in part because at this point in our church history, I'm the only elder. According to our constitution and our bylaws, I am the only one in this church who holds the position of elder, which in and of itself is a problem, because Paul never, ever uses elder in a single way when he tells them to appoint elders in every church. Plurality of elders is the biblical model, and yet until we hire a uh, student ministries pastor, by our verbiage, I'm the only one. And so we're not going to get into the distinction between the lay elder and the pastoral elder, but if we decide uh, under the leading of the Holy Spirit to, uh, to take a look at how we do things around here, then a deeper study will need to be undertaken. We have in this passage a not much of a description of what the role of the episcopus is. And is it okay if I just use, instead of going back to the Greek over and over and over again, I'm going to use the most common term. We're going to go with elders. What is the role of elders? But again, elders are called pastors and shepherds and and, uh, bishops and overseers. It just depends on your translation. Now, what is the role? Well, these men... And the Greek is quite clear on this. They are to be males for many of the reasons we talked about last week. The role of elders is to be the spiritual leaders of the local church. We, and I say we because I'm clearly part of this group in regards to Squaw Creek Baptist Church, we are charged with seeing the mission of Squaw Creek carried out. This includes working to enable all the other disciples in the local church to carry out their sub-mission. So yes, you are called to be submissive, to the elders that God has placed over you. But again, it's not the kind of submission where you have to do whatever I say, and I'm a dictator. Matter of fact, we're going to cover that in just a second. We are, you know what, I'll cover it right now. We are not dictators. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 20, 25, and 26. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and that those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. He's talking to the apostles, the disciples, the big twelve. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. So while you are called to submission to the elders that God has placed over you, it is not the kind of submission where they are dictators and you have to do whatever is told of you. Instead, it's the same submission we've often covered in regards to the role of the wife and the woman within the family, to have a smaller mission that is yours, that God has uniquely enabled you to accomplish and to do, and in so doing, you're free from all the expectations of filling roles that are not yours. Our job as elders is to carry out the the mission of Squaw Creek, and that includes working to enable all the other disciples in the local church to carry out your sub-mission. We are under-shepherds, and we are tasked by the good shepherd with the care of his sheep, and if we don't take good care of his sheep, we answer to him. What did, uh, what did David do when his sheep were attacked? He grabbed the lion by the beard and he beat its brains out with a club. Sorry to get graphic, but it's in there. What will the good shepherd do to those shepherds he has placed over his sheep who abuse them? I, for one, don't want to find out. The role of elder is to care for the sheep. We are under shepherds, tasked by the good shepherd with the care of his sheep. Eldership is not a role to be taken on lightly. There's an awful lot of scripture about the responsibilities of its office within the church. It's clear that there's a heavier judgment that comes upon those who accept this role. 
Now, in being the spiritual leaders of the local church and being charged with seeing the mission of, of the local church carried out, that places us into the husband-father role in our church family. Now, that doesn't mean that you are the bride of James, like the church is the bride of Christ, far from it. But it is the fact that we are charged, we who are elders are charged with the safety, education, spiritual growth, and direction of the body that we call Squaw Creek Baptist Church. Where we go as a congregation, God will call the elders into account for what we do, the decisions we make, and the way that we lead the flock. Elders are not to be bogged down with the day-to-day operations, but are to devote themselves to the spiritual. This comes from Acts chapter 6, where the office of diaknos came into being, and we're going to get there in just a minute. The elders are to be the most maturing Christians, still disciples, learning and growing at all times. We're to be the ones who are furthest along the discipleship road, but we're still on the discipleship road. That's why even the apostles, now these are the people who walked with Jesus for three full years. They're the forerunners of the elder. When Acts chapter 6 came along, they had no time to wait on tables. Why? Because they already knew everything and and they were busy talking. No, we're to dedicate ourselves to the study and proclamation of God's word. They were still learning. So if they were still learning uh, to to hold and to live by sound doctrine, and they were still working to reproduce that sound doctrine and godly lifestyle in others, what hope have we as elders to stand before God and say, well, you know what, I kind of made it. You know, I got 30 years left in the old lifeline here, but I made it. No, far from it. We're to still be learning. Which leads me to the fourth and final thing I have to say about the office of elder. Our role is to lead but not dictate, to focus on the spiritual matters of the church and to make sure that we are replicating our faith in others. We simply cannot ask the congregation to disciple others if we're not actively demonstrating the behavior ourselves. We can't call uh, you to be disciples if we say we don't need any, to learn anything else. And so in a very tiny nutshell, this is kind of the job description of the episcopus to be the spiritual leaders of the local church because they're charged with seeing the mission of the church carried out, which puts them in the husband-slash-father role within the church family. They're to devote themselves, ourselves, to fulfilling and administering the spiritual authority given to us. We are to be the most maturing Christians, but still disciples learning and growing all the time. We have to constantly strive to be replicating our faith in others. Anybody want to sign up for that? It's not a not an easy new computer and I found that if I tap the pulpit too hard it suddenly shuts off that's not as handy as you would think maybe if I turn it this way behave All right, this is not an easy job this is not something that everybody wants but also we have to remember that uh, we're being critiqued in our job performance by Jesus Christ himself as well as every single person in the congregation. It's not a job to be taken on lightly, but let me tell you, if one is called to it, either professionally or as a lay elder, there is nothing that brings greater joy and no way to be content doing anything else. There have been a number of times in in the darker moments of my ministry career where I have literally been on my knees sobbing and crying out to the Lord, please let me do something else. I'm done with this. And God says, yeah, the problem is you stink at everything else. And you're not that good at that, but you stink least at being a pastor. I tell you, once those dark moments are past, nothing I'd rather do. It's tough. And I know I'm going to answer for every mistake that I make in a way that perhaps lay people don't. I wouldn't do anything else for a million dollars. So, let's go on to the qualifications of the elder. Somebody here who is bold and courageous, take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. Begin to read right there in verse 1 and go on down. And somebody call out to me, what is the first qualification for an elder? The first qualification of an elder. Somebody be brave and call it out. That's what I expected. And because, uh, because he's wearing a mask, I can't tell for sure, but I think I know who said that. And I can, I, I, I'm glad it was him because I can pick on him a little bit. That is a great answer if you like being wrong. But there's actually one before that. Dave, what? 
Male is one. Yes, we are, you, are, you are correct. That is good. And actually it does, I, I guess, come first. But here's what I see. They must desire the position of elder. Yes, they're, they're, they're males. Very good. I, I missed that one. But yes, a male must desire the position of elder. Now, here's where we start to rub up against Squaw Creek Baptist Church in a way that maybe isn't real cozy. Last week was a feel-good message. This week, the Word of God kind of feels like a file. It needs to rub on us a little bit. The problem we have here at Squaw Creek Baptist Church is the distinction between elder and deacon is really mushy. So we lump them together by referring to them as the executive board. And by the way, I've been accused of making up that term. It's clearly in the script, in, in, not the scriptures, clearly in the Constitution. I just use it more than perhaps has been used before I came here simply because I'm very uncomfortable with asking my deacons to be deacons when what I really, what the expectation really is, is to be an elder. And it's hard for me to say to the deacons, hey, this is your role according to the Word of God because according to the Word of God, what they actually do ain't what a deacon does. And so we have this mushiness that, that may need to be addressed. Um, and, and, and so... Let's understand that. There are some men in our fellowship that I think need to be on the executive board where the role of elders is fulfilled by the pastors and the deacons. And I could list some of them by name. I'm going to very intentionally look up there at the screen or down here at my computer so I don't make eye contact with some of them who are here in this room right now. I could list names of people I think should be on that board. And I won't. But one thing we absolutely must not do is try to coerce those men into serving on the executive board. If they don't desire to be Episcopus, they're not qualified. If, however, they are called by God to be one and refuse, well, they're going to have to work that out with the Holy Spirit. And, and with prayer and repentance, the Lord will give them the desire. I believe that. So having dealt with that, they must desire the position. What is the second qualification for eldership according to 1 Timothy 3, verse 2? Now, Jim, what is it? Blameless. blameless. Very good. Does blameless mean perfect? Boy, I hope not. Because as the only actual person called an elder uh, in this church, I, you only had to sit through about four minutes of first service to realize I am far from perfect or blameless. So what does the Greek actually mean? Well, what the Greek means is never caught doing wrong, but specifically is a legal term, they were never arrested. So there you go. If a man has ever been arrested for anything, he is disqualified from eldership, no matter what it was, no matter when it happened, or what his character is like now. If he was arrested as a 14-year-old for, for uh, spraying some graffiti on the high school wall, he is absolutely never, ever to serve as an elder ever in the church, no matter what, period, end of discussion, right? Before you answer that, let's read today's passage again. But we're going to read it out of a very specific translation. It's the HWWRIIWWC version, okay, as opposed to the New King James. It's based on the New King James, but it's actually the uh, HWWRIIWWC version. And here it is. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop or elder, he desires a good work. A bishop must then be blameless, both now and for his whole previous life. Traffic tickets are okay, but no arrests ever. The husband of one wife, now and even before he met Jesus, always temperate, even as a child or a teenager, sober-minded since the day he was born, of good behavior, having never gotten in trouble for anything ever, Hospitable so that even as a child in the church nursery, he always shared his toys without complaint. Able to teach even before he had the Holy Spirit to give him the spiritual gift of teaching. Not given to wine ever. Not violent. So former boxers, football players disqualified. The Greek there, by the way, means striker. Someone who hits. So if you've ever hit anybody ever in your entire life, you cannot be an elder. Bible says so. Uh, there it is. Not greedy for money. So we must interview their parents. If they ever ask for an increase in their allowance, not qualified for eldership. But gentle. They must submit video evidence of their ability to hold baby ducks before releasing them unharmed. Not quarrelsome. Zero fights with their wife. Ever. 
Not covetous, so you have to check with their neighbors to see if the elder candidate has ever bought a bigger boat or a newer car than them. One who rules his own house well. Um, one who rules his own house well, having never had any dysfunction or trouble, having his children in submission with all reverence. This means always and without exception. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not now, nor has he ever been a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. In other words, this guy must have been saved by grace in the womb, absent of a sin nature, because all of these qualifications are retroactive to before they became a Christian. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. Give him the Kavanaugh treatment. If you can find anyone ever who has ever said a bad word about him, he cannot be an elder. The HWWRIIWWC version. HWWRIIWWC version means how we would read it if we were consistent. See, if we put in front of each of these qualifications this imaginary made up retroactive curse that we put in front of one of them, that's how this passage would read. And there were some chuckles, because I I, I intended to be funny, but at the same time, towards the end, the chuckles kind of died off because you got a little sick of me adding stuff to Scripture, didn't you? You began to think, what is he doing with this? How dare he just use Scripture to make his point? Well, see, the problem is we don't read it from the HWWRIIWC version. We read it from the... T-I-H-W-A-D-I-B version, that this is how we always did it before. And if we read it in that version, it says this, a bishop must now be blameless, not ever divorced, now temperate, now sober-minded, now of good character, now hospitable, now able to teach, etc., etc., etc. See, it should anger us when people add anything to Scripture, anything at all whether it's a whole bunch of words in yellow or just, just a few. Christians, if we are building our theology, if we're building our doctrine on our own addition to the Word of God, we're wrong, and somebody better be getting angry over it. Here's my point. I'm going to move on to verses 8 through 13. It doesn't take a great deal of study to understand the, the terms and concepts outlined in the qualifications of elders. They're scrolling through on the screen behind me. There's a lot of them. And Christians just being, just being qualified with the ones that are here, that are clearly from Scripture, that's enough of a task. But to add to it some type of a retroactive curse, we just don't have the authority. We must never, ever add to Scripture. And the fact of the matter is, I've never met anyone who says an elder cannot have any type of a police record. I've known many former addicts, a few gangbangers, more than a few ex-cons who now do wonderful ministry. And nobody minds at all if their repentance is obvious, their salvation is manifest, if they have proven themselves to be reformed from what they were before Christ, we welcome them with open arms. I don't know any pastors who have never had a moment of rebellion, who have never wished they made a little more money, whose kids have always walked perfectly with the Lord. We simply don't make these qualifications retroactive to birth, except one, one. And I don't care how much you study the Greek, you simply can't find where the Bible says an episcopus cannot be divorced. The word divorce does not appear in this text, not anywhere. Furthermore, not one of these other qualifications listed are meant to describe somebody's pre-Christian life. You could have been a scoundrel for the first quarter century of your life. You could be in trouble with the law, greedy, quarrelsome. A man could have 16 kids with 18 different women, and as long as he didn't marry any of them, oh yeah, be an elder. However, should he marry and divorce one of those women and then come to know the Lord, if he's been walking with the Lord for 25 years flawlessly, faithful husband to his current wife, a godly father for his children. He still can't serve as a spiritual leader in some congregations, including this one, because we have somehow made a retroactive curse that applies to before they were Christians and making divorce an unforgivable sin. And I know what many of you are thinking, but be careful before you say, but the word of God says only one wife. 
By that definition, a remarried widower cannot be an elected leader. Nor can a single man. He's never been a, he's never been a husband of a wife. That guy's had two wives. The first one died. If you're going to get that nitpicky and start to tell the Word of God what it has to mean because of how you read it, be very cautious. We've had both of those types of leaders in my time here at Squaw Creek Baptist Church. Furthermore, the best understanding of the Greek term husband of one wife is probably more along the lines of a one-woman kind of guy, a faithful husband without wandering eyes or affections. Now, am I saying we need to just start appointing anyone who could fog a mirror to be an elder? Absolutely not. When we see this same phrase again in verse 12, should we just throw anybody into the position of deacon? No way. I believe great, even extreme caution has to be exercised before appointing anyone to a position of leadership who has a history of divorce. But you know what? We also have to be extremely cautious about appointing anybody to a position of authority who has a history of promiscuity or drunkenness or greed or violence or inhospitality or argumentativeness. We must be cautious to appoint people to leadership who are men and women of integrity, who hold and live by sound doctrine, who exalt Christ, love others, and reach the world. We need to be careful about who we appoint, not if they ever had a divorce in their history, but if they're not walking with the Lord, they've got no business in leadership. And if they are walking with the Lord, how dare we tell him his grace is insufficient for a mistake made before the Holy Spirit came into their life? How dare we? What I'm saying here is that we cannot pretend one of these qualifications is retroactive. Wow, we started over. We cannot pretend one of these qualifications is retroactive to before they knew Christ while the others are not. Neither the grace of God nor the text allows for it. I want to keep flipping through here as we move on to diakonos. It's just how my day's going, you know. Hey, there we go. All right. If you can find the slide that starts with diaknos, that'd be great. Now, some of you are wondering why I don't just use the, the English word deacon. I keep saying diaknos. Deacon. Well, that's a good question. The Greek word diaknos is the word for those who wait on tables. And it is exactly the same word we would translate as deacon or deaconess. Now, in Greek, the, the words have a gender, and diakonos is a male gender. However, it's a masculine gender. However, it is universally used. So in some, somehow, women are called diakonos. If you wait on tables at a restaurant, you're not a waitress, you're a server. But we have taken diakonos, which means server, and made it into waiters and waitresses, when in fact, no distinction exists. In the interest of time, let me make it simple. There is no gender distinction in this office, biblically speaking. But wait, you say, it says they have to be husbands. That means male. You are absolutely correct for verse 12. But no, 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 verse 11 says they're wives. That means they have to be male as well. Good eyes. Bad translation, good eyes. I'm going to pull up a screenshot of a website I, I occasionally use for help with my Greek. I'm not going to try to read it to you in the Greek. The Greek is there in the black. The, uh, the pronunciations are in the blue. The translations are in the orange. I know the... The, the, the words are kind of small. I can print this up for you if you want to see it, but I'm going to zoom in on a couple of important things here. What the Greek actually says there at the beginning of verse 11 is women, the Greek word being gynakis or gynakis, and it means women. Now, it can also mean wife, and it does in verses 2 and 12, but that depends on what it refers to. If the word uh, gynecus refers back to or is connected grammatically to a male than it is a wife. If, however, it's connected to something else, that tells you whether it means woman or wife. In this case, these ladies, verse 11 says, must be dignified, not slanderers, clear-minded, and faithful in all things. The women in this paragraph are to be dignified, not slanderers, clear-minded, faithful in all things. Now, if grammatically, gynecus referred back to the, the word deacon, the men, if it was connected there grammatically, 
the correct answer would be their wives. However, grammatically, it is connected to those who are dignified, not double-tongued, not being given to too much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain, holding the mystery of the faith with clear conscience, who are being tested and are showing themselves to be blameless servants. Translation. Diakonos must be exceptional Christians, not giving in to the temptations typical of their gender. For men, what are some temptations that are typical for men? Not everybody, but just, uh, you know, kind of a rule of thumb, what do guys struggle with? Lust, drunkenness, greed. Yeah, that's us. Always trying to get that little more, little more recognition, always with a little bit of a wandering eye. These are the things that we struggle with. For ladies, what's well, kind of a general rule of thumb struggle that you might have? Gossip, being emotionally driven, willing to, to waffle and whatever based upon. And so the, Paul is saying, diagnose, male and female must be exceptional Christians, not giving in to temptations typical of their gender. They have to understand their faith, but not to the same extent as elders. That's why diaconoi are told to hold the mystery of the faith, but episcopus are called to teach it. Diagnose are learning. They're students. You have freedom to say, you know what, I don't, I don't understand it all, but I'm working under, I, I, I'm going to hold on to the mystery of the faith. I'm going to hold tightly to my faith, even though I don't have as many answers as I'd like. But the elders are to have the answers, or at the very least, be able to find them. There's a higher standard for those in the elder than in the deacon position. Above all, though, diakonos are to be servants servants so rather than having a board of deacons who function as elders and a deaconess committee that functions as hostesses and compassion ministry coordinators and the other things that the deaconesses do the biblical model is to have a group of individuals male and female who spend their time diligently searching for opportunities to serve needs to be met and ways they can free the elders up to pursue the spiritual leadership of the local body if I'm honest the trustees and the deaconesses probably are closer to the biblical view of deacons than are our deacons who are closer to the biblical view of elders now this does not mean that diaconos are not spiritual leaders but that they as an office are not given spiritual authority in scripture you think about Stephen clearly a great leader but not a, an elder, not, a, not one given authority, but certainly a leader. Philip, certainly a leader, but in the capacity of the local church, he was not given the spiritual authority of eldership so far as we know in Scripture. Phoebe, a female, clearly called a diagnos in Scripture, but that does not mean that she was given spiritual authority, contradicting what Paul writes in other passages, but simply that she was a servant. She spent her time looking for ways to serve, needs to be met, and a way to, to care for the elders so they could be free to do the spiritual leadership that was put on them. They're spiritual leaders. And that's why the qualifications are so high. But the weight of the responsibility of the flock is not on the deacon's shoulders, the diakonos shoulders, that's on the elder, pastor, shepherd, bishop office. So is it time to change our bylaws, reorganize the church? I don't know, maybe. Is that why I preach this today? Absolutely not. I am describing and instructing you in what the Word has to say. What we do with it as a body has to be the result of the Holy Spirit. He may want us to tackle this, or he may have more urgent matters to which we must attend. Let's be obedient. Let's just commit to being obedient and praying through our response to this passage. After all, I, there's no way I even came close to giving us all the information we need to understand these two offices. That's a deeper study, and we need to do the work to really know what we are supposed to do and what we're called to before we start throwing out 50 years of tradition. So I'm not, I'm not saying, uh, let's, let's charge ahead I just want you to know what the Word of God says. And what we do with it will let the Holy Spirit lead us. However, for us today, because I look out here and the majority of people here, the majority of people watching on the internet at home are neither elders nor deacons. But we are disciples. 
What does this passage tell us about being and making disciples? Plenty. The goal of the Christian walk is maturity in Christ. To be as far down the discipleship road as you're able before it ends. Or more accurately, before the journey is completed. For someday in the twinkling of an eye, we will be with Christ and like Christ. And the discipleship journey ends. And the eternal presence of our God is fully realized. And I, for one, say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But what does this passage teach us as disciples? Well, within the qualifications of the episcopus, elders, pastors, bishops, whatever you want to call within the qualifications of the elders, we see a description of mature Christianity. We can all strive to be these things. Now, you can't perhaps be a one-woman kind of guy if you are a gal, but you can be faithful. Okay, and so we, with a solid family, maybe you're a single person, you don't have a family, you can still have integrity in your dealings with the world. So this is a description of mature Christianity. Let's strive to reach this. Whether you'll ever be an elder or not, strive to reach that. (laughs) Within the calling to deaconhood, we see a maturing Christian, a, a, a shorter list to be sure. And I'm not going to try to go through all these. I I can mention a couple. Be reverent. Don't be double-tongued. Honesty and integrity are not out of reach for any believer, no matter how new you are in the faith. And don't give in to the temptations that seem most common to your gender. I'm going to plug a book here. Jerry Bridges wrote this book. It's called Respectable Sins, Confronting the Sins We Tolerate. And in it, he, he challenged us to address the sins we often overlook because they're so common. He has a chapter on ungodliness and anxiety and frustration and discontentment, unthankfulness, pride, selfishness. I could add complacency, gossip, willful ignorance, stubbornness, rebellion against authority. The the list goes on. There are things that we call human condition. That's part of human nature. We're never going to get rid of them, so let's not worry about them. But the Bible wants us to root out all sin because we've been made a new creation. The biblical deacon came into being in Acts 6... And the very broad description, as I see it, is here on the right. Spend your time looking for ways to bless others, then do it. Serve in such a way that those who are charged with other duties are freed up to concentrate on them. For the diaknos, that means helping the elders. For the layperson, it's any servant. So boil it all down. Strive to be this. Strive to reach the standards laid out for elders. Strive to be a disciple worthy of the title diaknos. But both episcopus and diaknos are to be disciples, holding and living by sound doctrine, doing the things disciples do, exalting Christ, loving others, reaching the lost. Whether you ever serve in one of these offices within the church, you can still strive to be like them. And those who do serve in these capacities need to, would do well to remember we're setting an example. And we need to make sure it's one that God wants them to follow. But in both sections... Of Scripture, God through Paul reminds us of how important it is to have a good reputation, especially outside the church. Verse 7 He must have a good testimony among those who are on the outside, lest he fall into reproach, the snare of the devil. Verse 13 For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith. What do you need boldness for to get out there and reach the lost? One of the most famous diaknoi in Scripture, Philip. And it took a great deal of courage to hop up in the back of the Ethiopian eunuch's chariot and explain the gospel to him. Great boldness in the faith. So Christians, strive to reach the maturity of an elder. Strive to be the kind of disciple that makes you a a servant, a diaknos. And strive to have this kind of witness. The Christian life, the life of a disciple is all about striving, but within the power of the Holy Spirit. We have no power on our own to reach any of these goals. But striving to live in a way worthy of an elder or a diagnos is the work of a disciple. And it's easy to see how living that way exalts Christ. It's also easy to see how serving the church helps us love others. But it's a final point reminds us that reaching the lost is often a culmination of exalting Christ with our lifestyle and proving our love for others by serving faithfully. Those are the three things that disciples do. What disciples are are those who hold and live by sound doctrine. And that leads us to live in such a way that we exalt Christ 
serve in a way that we love others, and as a result of those things, we reach the world. Not all of you will be elders. Not many of you will be diaknos. Not a lot of us will serve in officially recognized and congregationally sanctioned leadership roles, but all of us can be qualified for the roles open to us by being a disciple. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to be disciples who hold and live by sound doctrine. We want to be busy doing the things that disciples do, exalting you, loving each other, reaching the lost. But Lord, to do those things, we must put in the work. To know your word, we must be willing to be led by you, O Holy Spirit. We must take challenging passages and allow them to permeate our hearts and our minds. We must strive for Christ-likeness, knowing that it cannot be achieved, only given, and that only when we see you face to face. We long for that day, but until it comes, we each know that we have some road ahead of us. Help us to not only finish the journey well, but to walk each leg of that journey in a way that brings you glory, builds others up, and proclaims the good news to those who are perishing. It's in your name we pray these things.